so uh, today, thank you very much for, for coming in. And uh, we decided to do a little bit different approach uh, this week, uh, an opportunity to get into a, a deeper dive with our experts, our healthcare experts here uh, with the state. And I want to thank uh, Secretary Gobey and his team for participating. Uh, so we want to uh, talk about uh, health care reform efforts uh, thus far and to present some very, very preliminary, and I want to repeat, very preliminary uh, observations on our 2017 Medicaid pilot, which was built around the accountable care model. So Al and his team uh, have been working on health care uh, reform longer than I've been in office, at least this office, the governor's office. Uh, towards the end of the previous administration, uh, their efforts had uh, come around and, and led them to what is now known as the all-payer model. As many of you may recall, I was a bit apprehensive at that time and questioned, I was new into the office and questioned how this would affect our Vermonters' experience, <coughs> how it would address costs, and how uh, what uh, Vermont's health care providers would think about this. And, and so I was cautious, uh, and uh, appropriately so, uh, because after our experience with single payer, it was important to have answers uh, to those questions before declaring it the answer. So one of the, uh, one of the very first briefings I had when I took office was uh, from the group here today advocating for a pilot project uh, between Vermont's Medicaid program and One Care, uh, an accountable care organization. The concept, which is similar to the all-payer model, is to pay providers who are participating uh, uh, in a set amount for the care of a distinct population. So in February of 2017, Secretary Gobey and I announced that this pilot would be taking place. And as I said then, uh, we'd be monitoring its progress. And that's why we're here today to share some of the results uh, from this uh, program's first year. It's important, again, to note, uh, this is preliminary. Uh, this is one year of data. Uh, we can't call it a trend uh, by any means, but it does give me and the team here today some additional confidence around the direction of health care reform and the all-payer model. So with that, uh, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Secretary Gobey, who will de detail the scope of the challenge uh, and as well uh, how the all-payer model can help address some of those issues. Thank you, Governor. So uh, first, I want to uh, recognize uh, Vicki, who's in the audience from OneCare, and say thank you for being here today, uh, representing OneCare, the ACO that's a part of this. Um, just to take a step back, um, question comes up all the time, what, uh, what was the purpose of the all-payer model, what was the thinking behind the all-payer model, what is the problem that we're trying to solve, and how are we doing looking at it today and into the future? And so what I would like to do is say that I think about healthcare in three uh, buckets. Um, the first is how we collect the money, the second is how we pay for goods and services, and the third is how we deliver the care. And it's important to understand the three buckets and how they relate to each other in terms of our current system and in terms of the reforms that we're trying to make. So when we think about how we collect the money, it's important to understand that that's done through a lot of different entities, Medicare, Medicaid, and a whole host of commercial payers within the state. And then when we move to the payment bucket, they all pay in a, in a myriad of different ways for the goods and services in healthcare and then providers respond by delivering that care in varied ways based on the payment or based on uh, current science or both. What the all-payer model tries to do is address some of the problems that we see in healthcare. But before I talk about problems, I want to also say that Vermont is a great place uh, to live and get care. We've been considered to be one of the best um, places to have um, you know, to live due to uh, health um, outcomes and the quality of our providers. And so when we talk about um, what problems are we trying to solve in healthcare, it is not to say um, a, a criticism to our provider community or the care that's being delivered to Vermonters. It's to say um, healthcare currently grows 
at about two to three times the rate of inflation, um, and that's over a long period, and that is not sustainable. The second point I'd make is that care is typically delivered in Vermont and in, and in the United States in an uncoordinated way. And third, um, it's important to understand that across payers, um, there's different uh, ways in which the care is delivered um, that doesn't lead to the uh, best health um, for all concerned. So basically I'm saying we think there's room to improve um, how fast health care costs grow. We think there's room to improve how well care is coordinated. And we think there's room to improve health outcomes for Vermonters. And when you look at the information we have before us, um, you're going to see that that's happening in the document we've provided under the Medicaid pilot, but it's also happening at the federal level under ACOs. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn to Ina Backus, who's the Director of Healthcare Reform, and she's going to make some comments on where we're at today. Vermont's all-payer model is a model that's based on Medicare's Next Generation ACO program, and that's a program that's been in place prior to Vermont's all-payer model. The model that Vermont has is a six-year agreement between Vermont and the federal government that allows for Medicare to participate with Vermont in a specific Vermont payment reform to pay health care providers differently. The agreement is six years, but it's measured by five performance years. 20, uh, 2018 marks the first performance year for the all-payer model agreement between Vermont and the federal government. However, we're here today to talk about 2017 results for Vermont's Medicaid program, which actually went first in implementing the alternative payment model arrangement. Similarly, Medicare has been operating, as I said, its own next generation ACO program, and it has recently received released results from 2016 that indicate promising early results for Medicare ACOs that are participating in the Next Generation pro uh, Program. Those ACOs have been able to maintain quality while generating savings for the Medicare program. Touching quickly back to 2018 and how the model has been implemented to date, 112,000 Vermonters are a part of the Medicare uh, all-payer model, excuse me. Of those 112,000 Vermonters, three major payer groups are participating, Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial payers. That's what brings together the all-payer model is participation across the different payer groups. That means the incentives are aligned and the payment change is more uniform across the payer groups. Self-funded commercial payers are also participating in the model. The network includes hospitals, primary care providers, specialists, FQHCs, skilled nursing facilities, home health providers, designated agencies, and area agencies on aging, all working together as a part of the Accountable Care Organization, One Care Vermont, that is the organization in this state that can accept this alternative payment model. So I'm going to step in here and talk a little bit um, about, uh, give you a little context for those of you um, that don't follow healthcare on a daily basis, which um, we're in the weeds on a daily basis, but um, DIVA, Department of Vermont Health Access. For the record, identify yourself. Corey Gustafson, I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Vermont Health Access. And uh, we are the state's publicly funded healthcare plan, and so on a you know, our fundamental responsibilities are to uh, determine eligibility of, of Vermonters that apply for, to our programs, enroll them in those programs, enroll providers in programs, and then when the two come together, we pay for the, the, that, those healthcare services. And just for sort of financial context, we pay for over a billion dollars in healthcare services annually on behalf of our members. And so this is obviously a big part of the, the, um, the state's expenditures, and so it is important that we are continuously um, evaluating how, um, how we do things, and this is a little bit of a next step. Given that context, too, I think the other thing that's important to um, think about and recognize is that Vermont has been uh, a leader. We've been leaders in, in examining how we uh, uh, 
interact with the healthcare system and how our members uh, experience the healthcare system. I think the best example is probably the Blueprint for Health. Um, you know, going all the way back to the the uh, original 1115 waiver, um, that flexibility that the federal government gave us to um, cover services in a different way um, has has led to some pretty significant forward progress in coordination of care, which is one of the issues we're trying to um, con to continue to uh, address. And um, so. Um, I think in most recently, the blueprint, uh, the hub and spoke model is another great example. So six years ago, the state of Vermont um, looked at the opioid em epidemic and, and determined that it, it needed to um, address it in a systematic fashion that covered all parts of the state. Um, we have now done that, and as recently as yesterday, the um, Human Services Secretary uh, made note that MAT, Medicaid Assisted Treatment, which the hub and spoke um, provides to Vermonters um, is the gold standard. Um, and so to us, the ACO program, this effort, is, a, is another example of Vermont being on the leading edge of healthcare reform. And so it's early, and this is, um, as Ina said, it's early in the process. Um, we today have some results to share with you, as the governor said. And, uh, you know, from my perspective as the DIVA commissioner, um, you know, at the beginning, I'm a little bit like the coach. I have a background in sports, and I'm thinking, who's the best team for to address to take on this um, this uh, project? And so, uh, early on, the, the the goal was to identify a team. Michael Costa, the deputy commissioner of Diva, is 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 a lead on it, along with Alicia Cooper, who is the director of our healthcare, or excuse me, our payment reform team at Diva. And so, um, the team was identified. Um, the next modest goal was to stand the program up. There's definitive changes that needed to be made in how we do things and how we pay for, for, for uh, services and how we track and measure spending. Some, so there were some clinical changes. So in the, in, in the time between identifying the team and, and executing um, to, to today's date and having results for tw the 2017 year, um, that team has, has basically on a daily basis thought about this and and step by step moved forward um, the last I think goal we had was to be patient and to not try to um, do everything um, on day one and so just take the, the problems as they come um, we knew there'd be things we didn't expect but we also knew that the the goal which was to address um, fragmentate fragmentation in the system both on the provider side so lack of coordination among providers some duplication things that we've all heard about when we think about health care um, and this and the delivery system um, but there's also fragmentation on the payer side we have multiple payers in our um, in our in our health that, that pay into our health care system and pay providers and the better alignment we can have um, the better experience we think our members will be subject to um, as they have interactions with their providers and so um, decreasing fragmentation is one of the goals we've had we think we've um, started down that path. Um, the second is just the incentives of fee-for-service. I think the um, secretary um, had mentioned the incentives of fee-for-service, but I would say that the idea to remove um, if you do more, you get more from the equation is, is one of our fundamental goals. Um, and with greater revenue predictability, our, our premise is if they, we pay prospectively to, to providers, they will have more flexibility to, to um, address um, the health care needs of their, their patients on the front end rather than um, wait till the back end. And so they have more flexibility with the dollars they have through that prospective payment system. And so um, I think we achieved our early goals, our modest goals, setting up a team and, and so on. And uh, right now we're here to talk about what the results of, um, of the first year are. And I think Michael's going to kick us off with the, the, uh, with the basic results. So as Commissioner Gustafson said, the, the leadership of the governor and the secretary. Can we slide the mic? The leadership of. Just yours or? Yeah. Just <laughs> <laughs> It'd be easier that way. <laughs> so uh, as Commissioner Gustafson said, with the leadership of the governor and Secretary Gobey, They've said clearly what we want, predictable, sustainable, and affordable health care costs while maintaining high quality and has challenged the Department of Vermont Health Access to figure out how we do it um, while working with our ACO partner. Uh, the report you have in front of you lays out our initial results from 2017. 
And I think, as the governor said, it is far too early to call this a trend. However, we've learned a few things through operating this program in 2017. Uh, number one, we're capable of launching and operating the program successfully. That required a focus on the fundamentals. Can we pay differently, giving healthcare providers a consistent capitated payment rather than paying them for each service and test that they deliver? Uh, can we monitor quality and cost on an ongoing basis? And can we analyze those results to learn things to improve the healthcare system on behalf of Vermonters? And so we think we've done that successfully at least for year one. Uh, the second result is that the program is growing. Uh, ACO-based reform is a coalition of the willing. Providers are not obligated to sign up. They must choose to take part uh, and serve Vermonters in this way. We began with four communities and around 2,000 unique Medicaid providers in 2017, and that has grown to 10 communities in 2018 and 13 communities, we believe, in 2019, all while doubling the amount of providers participating. Uh, our third result is that the ACO program spent less than expected on health care in 2017. Uh, at the beginning of each year, uh, the Medicaid program and the ACO agree on a price for the health care of Vermonters for the year. Uh, in 2017, that was approximately $82 million, and uh, we believe that the ACO program spent approximately $2.4 million while caring for those Vermonters. The fourth of five results is that the ACO met most of its quality targets. We have a score of 85 percent on our quality targets, um, and an interesting story to tell there, and Alicia Cooper, our Director of Payment Reform, will get into the details a little more in a moment. And then the fifth result is that Medicaid is seeing more use of primary care among people inside the ACO program as opposed to our beneficiaries who are outside the ACO program. Again, this is just a first piece of data. It is too early to call it a trend or to see whether it's statistically significant, but it's a positive sign that the ACO program is allowing us to focus more on the relationship between Vermonters and their primary care doc as we think about how people get their care around the state. Uh, at this point, I would hand it over to Alicia Cooper. She and her team manage this project on a daily basis as part of our payment reform team as we think about how to make more value-based payments, how to make sure we're paying for quality in the healthcare system, not just quantity. And she's going to talk a little more about the financial results and the quality results. Thank you, Michael. Um, as Michael mentioned, uh, the agreed upon price in the contract represented what Medicaid believed it would have spent on the population of ACO attributed beneficiaries for the 2017 performance year. The results showed that the ACO's actual spending was less than expected. And this is important because the model is changing provider flexibilities. Um, these flexibilities should allow providers to focus more on the kinds of services that keep Vermonters healthy. In order to really understand the program's effect on keeping Vermonters healthy, it's also important that we're monitoring and evaluating the quality of care and the utilization of services. The quality results, as Michael mentioned, shows that Vermonters are receiving high quality care in certain areas. Uh, for example, the ACO showed performance that was above the national 75th percentile in diabetes control for this population of Vermonters. There was high performance in certain other areas as well, but the quality results also show opportunities for improvement. The financial model puts uh, a certain amount of incentive on providers focusing on quality as the program continues to evolve, and so there will be areas where providers who are participating will keep paying attention and trying to improve as we have more years of program experience. We also look at the services that Vermonters have been receiving under this model. And as Michael noted, we're seeing that Vermonters who are part of the ACO population are seeing more primary care utilization than Vermonters outside of this model. And this is important because primary care providers can really help Vermonters focus on staying well, and when they need services, they can help them get those services in a coordinated way. So that's basically what we have to say. We'd now like to open it up to questions on what we've presented. So what, what is the bottom line here? Are Vermonters in the ACO saving money 
and are they getting better care? So I think the, the first thing we have to say, and, and I want to apologize for not saying it earlier, is congratulations. <laughs> Isn't that the first thing we have to say? No, it's not. Yes, it is. <laughs> so uh, and, and then to answer your question, I think that, uh, and, and I'll open it up to anybody, and we're going to have to play a little microphone game here. I think that this is one year, and it's the beginning of an all-payer model, and it's only one payer, and it's only some of the providers. And so when we're, um, while we're cautiously optimistic about all this, we want to be clear on what it is. It's year zero, just Medicaid. And so, you know, the question you're asking is, you know, did it save money? Well, um, when you set a prospective payment and you do the actuarial work to say, is this what we think we're going to spend on this? You make the assumption that that's right, and that's what you would have paid. And so um, the answer is, uh, it, it was predictable payment. It's not about necessarily saving money. You want to fund it properly. The, the second thing I'd make, uh, the point I'd make is that when it comes to quality in this model, um, I remember the moment at the Green Mountain Care Board where we saw the first quality results from the all-payer shared savings, which is not the same type of risk structure as this, where one of the doctors involved said, this is the first time we could measure anything. You know, and that was only a few short years ago. And so these quality measures in here are really important. Um, and uh, having data on them longitudinally is going to be incredibly important to judging um, the efficiency of the system and, and how well it does. But do you, does anyone want to add to? I'm just going to add <clears throat> as well. I think it, it's going to take time uh, to prove this out. Uh, because when you look at what the, the, the premise of all, the all-payer model is, is uh, a part of it is prevention, uh, trying to treat the patient holistically and look for areas of opportunity to do so, so that you're not just paying fee for service, you're paying for keeping the patient healthy. So this may take a while to prove itself out, is my point. Um, it won't be in the first year, it may not be in the second year, it could be years from now when we'll see the true benefit of this. So uh, again, if we can save money along the way, it's all good. Uh, but uh, and, and, and essential, but it's the quality of care that we're giving in the, for the future, I think that is uh, really I, I'm most enthusiastic about because uh, in every regard, uh, whether we're talking about whether we're talking about um, uh, health care or we're talking about any other initiative uh, with the opioid epidemic and so forth, it's about prevention. Uh, so uh, we need to, uh, to continue to focus on that. Al, how do you ensure that it, the savings are not that people are being denied care or not receiving the care that they should be getting? So, uh, you know, that's where the measures come in. You know, in, in other words, if you just said we're going to change the way we pay, but we're not going to measure anything at all, you, you know, then you could say that that might happen. Do you, do you want to talk about what some of the measures are that would speak directly to this? Sure. Shuffle some of these back down here. <laughs> thank you. So, thank you. That's a great question, and I think that gets back to the earlier point of the importance of monitoring both quality performance and the utilization of services in order to make sure that beneficiaries are still receiving services in a way that is comparable to how they had previously. We look at utilization of primary care services in addition to utilization of emergency departments, um, inpatient stays, uh, high cost services like radiology, um, keeping an eye on all of that to understand how practice is changing when the financial incentives are changing. Um, based on the first year of experience, we have not seen significant enough differences in certain areas to be able to say what is driving some of these reductions um, relative to what the expen expected expenditure was. Uh, we also look at quality, as the Secretary noted. We have measures that relate to primary care utilization, we have measures relating to screenings, and we have measures related to um, the treatment of more chronic conditions. So all of these give us additional lenses into the care that the population is receiving in order for performance to be 
good on those measures, the utilization of services has to be occurring. So the, the 2.4 million less that was spent in 2017 calendar year, mm -hmm. that now goes back to the providers that were in that Medicaid pilot? So the program sets the price um, up front with the ACO. In this case, that was $82 million. Uh, it gets paid to the ACO, and then the ACO has agreements with its provider network about what happens if money is saved. And it goes, it's my understanding that money will flow back to providers in that system. But one of the key things to know about ACO-based reform is that the state is in the position of saying what it wants, particularly regarding predictable, sustainable costs and high quality, but it's up to the healthcare community through the ACO to figure out how to do it. Uh, and that's how they do the savings in the program. So, but the bottom line is the whoever the providers that were participating in 2017 in this pilot will get to sort of figure out collectively how to uh, yes. divvy up the, the savings? That's correct. And then so 2017 was Medicaid alone. 2018 calendar year, it's expanded to commercial and Medicare. Does anything, have you seen anything translate from that 2017 pilot to 2018 thus far that tells you the expansion was a good step? We'll know about 2018 and about this time next year. Al, do you have any uh, feedback from uh, Vermonters who participated about any differences that they felt about being part of this? Uh, did it, did it, was it more satisfactory uh, in some way? Or was it completely uh, transparent and nothing that the patients noticed? So I would I would turn to the team here I to answer that so one of the things that we monitor are the calls that both Medicaid and one care receive from the beneficiaries who are part of the model to see if they have questions or concerns about any particular parts of their experience with care um, in the first year of the program, there were relatively few calls uh, that were related to concerns or complaints. I think on the whole, since approximately 29,000 Medicaid beneficiaries were impacted by the model, that reflects that relatively few were having um, differences in their experience of care that were adverse. Uh, in terms of monitoring the experience of care in future, we are trying to identify additional ways of understanding the experience of care so that we can not just be looking at um, whether providers have, whether, whether beneficiaries have concerns, but also look at what some of their more direct experiences are and how those experiences compare to individuals who are not part of the model. And, and if I could just add, I think uh, obviously, you know, the patient perspective is the single most important perspective. But I also think in this model, because it takes willing primary care providers to sign up to grow and build an ACO, what, what I've been looking at is, you know, are uh, the roles growing or are the roles shrinking? And so as we've come into 2018, as we've seen additional um, uh, folks come on to uh, the program, it gives me uh, sort of the feedback I need from the provider community that it's going according to plan as the scale increases. And so I think that's also something we have to judge over time as a, as a key indicator. The, this sheet from CMS from 2016 notes that uh, the number of beneficiaries per ACO ranges from 8,200 to about 65,500. In 2018, we now have 110 in our program. Does that make us one of the biggest in the, in the country out of these projects right now? Yes. That, that sheet is for, excuse yeah. me, for just Medicare. We have 112 across all payers okay. right now. So these are just Medicare, okay. Yes. So you can see we yeah. have about 39,000 okay. Medicare beneficiaries in Vermont. Gotcha. But today's data reflects the experience of 29,000 Vermonters in Medicaid in 17. In 2017. Okay. How, how do you know that the quality measure uh, data is accurate. I mean, maybe this is a dumb question, but if the providers have a financial stake in those numbers being good, is there some type of way that you check, out, check in on those numbers? 
Yes, that's an excellent question. Um, the majority of the measures are calculated by looking at uh, medical claims data and the calculations are performed by an independent third-party analytics vendor. Uh, a number of the measures also rely on clinical information, so information that doctor's offices will have, um, and OneCare works with its provider network to uh, collect the information from those clinical records to support uh, the reporting on those quality measures. So some of the information is coming from providers, but it's collected in a very standardized way with a set methodology, and some of the information is coming from a third party that is separate from the provider, so it's not strictly provider reported. Are there any particular soft spots in the report, things where you would like to see things go better in the next year? It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I mean, I think the first thing is that our reaction isn't that it's all good. I mean, I think our reaction is that, um, and, and I think it's most people's reaction, that, um, that we have a lot of work to do on health care. Um, we have a lot of work to do on uh, access, affordability, um, you know, distribution of resources in the health care system. I mean, there's none of us that think uh, that this advancement is uh, the final result. We, you know, to Corey's point, this is a an evolutionary step in a lengthy process of Vermont being a leader in reforming its healthcare system. It is not a boil the ocean idea that is fixing every problem uh, that could be written down in the healthcare system. So this is focusing again on payment and delivery. Um, 86 cents on every dollar of health care goes toward chronic conditions. This is an attempt to deliver health care in a way that addresses chronic conditions in a more coordinated way, but it certainly doesn't fix all the problems of how we collect the money, how all of health care is paid for, or any delivery issues um, that anyone would run into. So um, again, it's, it's a, you know, for us it's a huge deal. I don't want to uh, undercut it. The team has done an amazing job. I can't say enough good things about them, but it is an incremental step. Governor, would you say you've gone from skeptic to believer in this system? Hold uh, on, what? what? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm cautiously optimistic at this time with the results that we've seen over the last year. Uh, but as I said, this, this doesn't make a trend. Uh, I'm looking forward to what it's going to say next year. Uh, because, as we all know, uh, health care is difficult. Uh, if, if it was easy uh, to solve, we would have done it long before now, and it would have been accomplished by, uh, throughout, uh, throughout the country in some way. So we want to do this uh, in an incremental way. We need to prove to Vermonters uh, that we, uh, we, can, we can prove that we're making gains on this, uh, and uh, we're willing to do the hard work in order to do it. You can't just declare victory and say that we've, we've solved it, uh, we have to prove this. And, uh, and I think that the, we're doing that as we speak. Another, another report from the Green Mountain Care Board shows that the ACO isn't meeting its scale targets for either Medicare or all payer, um, the number of attributed people in the system. How concerning is that to you as the state tries to meet its overall goals with CMS? Yeah, so um, I'm not concerned about it at this point. Mm -hmm. Because my main concern, and, and I said this when I was chair of the Greenmont Care Board, was getting too much scale too soon. Um, the first thing we had to be able to do as a state was uh, talk Michael Costa and Corey and Alicia into doing their jobs because they are so talented to change the way that Medicaid paid was such an operational risk. I cannot um, state that enough. And working on the measures, such an operational risk, to prove that we could do that to the provider community and to um, the patient community you know in this you know that this report confirms that we did it until we got to this point we we couldn't say we needed more scale we needed to know that this it's incremental we need to know that this was working now we'll work on scale we still have a lot of work to do in the way we're doing this so does medicare so does commercial um, you know every you know you know the boss is sitting to my left you know, he's looking at this and saying, prove it to me every single step of the way that this is working and is the right thing to do. And if not, um, 
will have a bad day. And so go, saying that you want scale too early w would not be a good thing. That said, we still have to, if we're going to do the five-year agreement, get there. Mm -hmm. And so that will be a priority. But it wasn't the first priority. So were those initial scale targets too ambitious then? Um, because there's no punitive impact of them, mm -hmm. You know, I just said, you know, when, I, when, we, were, when the, we were looking at doing them, it was a guess. And, you know, the key thing CMS was saying to us at the time was, don't grow too big too fast. Mm -hmm. Get this right in every step, and we'll talk about it. And so if we don't make them, we've got to have a conversation with them. But it's not going to be an uh, antagonistic one, because their number one priority was that this was done well, so it didn't, uh, it didn't collapse under its own weight. And so I would prefer to be where we are with the scale issue than have it be the opposite way. Does the state have any interest in contracting with uh, OneCare Vermont for its own state employee and retiree health care plans? So that's about attractiveness. You know, so if we're going to go to, uh, to folks and say that's a good idea, we have to, again, have done it all well to get to the point where we can say, hey, this is attractive. I would say that to any self-insured plan that was looking at it. But with the way that it's going and the predictability of the trend, and if we can actually show that it's improving health outcomes, then it will be attractive and it won't take um, any force or any uh, cajoling. It'll just, it'll be something that folks will want to do and that would be a goal. We're, we're not at that point at this point yeah, in time. That's right. Uh, but, uh, you know, who knows in the future? Again, if we can prove ourselves uh, and uh, be more attractive, then they'll come, that they'll want to be a part of it. Is, is saving $2.4 2 million on an $82 million bill, is that a lot? Uh, $2.4 million is a lot to me. Well, but, I mean, were you just surprised? Seems uh, like a pretty narrow. So, so uh, when we said we were going to go forward with this, my conversation with Dr. John Bromstead was, you know, if we end up 3% up or 3% down, somewhere in there, is it, is it worth it to do all the learning to build all this so it works? And his point was, yes. So he was willing to take the risk if he, you know, if it went the other way, we were willing to take the risk if it went this way, to get it stood up to see if the machinery could actually operate. So to me, it's not about the money because I actually don't think the way to look at it is that that's a savings. It's that we paid what we thought it was going to cost, and then providers actually operated differently. Differently, when that happens, you can't say what would have, what would have occurred in an alternative universe. It's just you've changed the incentives, so you've changed the behavior, so you've changed the outcome. Yeah, I want to reiterate. Uh, it isn't just about the savings right now, and this year, or next year, or the following year, uh, which are, they're important. But it's the outlying years, you know, with prevention and the way we're delivering uh, health care, uh, we could save significant uh, amounts of money if we do this right 10 years from now, 15 years from now, 20 years from now, and, uh, and people will be healthier as a, as a result. Does anyone have what the, the $82 million, what the per person cost was based on that number, and then what the reality was with the $2.4 million less? If we don't have it here, we can get it for you, Neil. Absolutely. We have it. Yeah. But by the way, this, all this math was done by an actuarial firm for, uh, for AHS, and it was vetted by the Green Mountain Care Board and their actuary. So it was done through a, through a two-step process to get to these numbers. Yeah. Uh, we have, I don't know if this jibes with what people are talking about today, but we do have a shortage of primary care doctors in the state, and it seems to be trending in the wrong direction. We've got a lot of old primary care doctors in the state. Uh, does this program bump up against that harsh reality at some point? So it, it would be my hope. So first of all, I don't disagree with your point, but I would say that I believe we have the highest per capita amount of primary care in the country. I'd want to verify if we're number one or number two, but it's pretty high. And so we're not happy with where it is, but I wouldn't want to give Vermonters the feeling that we're number 50. Um, and so, but to your point, we're all getting a day older every day, um, and primary care is uh, pivotal, pivotal to this. My hope is that if you change the payment methodology, 
and you change the incentives and you change the way primary care is delivered, we'll actually be a place that primary care physicians, again, are attracted to and want to come because they won't be trapped in the 15-minute office visit turnstile that they will be everywhere else. And so if this works, again, and this incremental step, um, I'm hoping it also helps workforce because you're not wrong. Well, and, and we should mention as well, uh, this is across the board uh, in every sector. We have workforce challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a shortage of, of people in the state, and uh, that's part of the overall goal to focus on workforce development and attracting more people to the state in any way we can. And, uh, and in this area, it's, uh, it's no exception. Different subject? Sure. <laughs> can I just throw this one question to you, maybe before the two different subjects? And where are you from? Yeah, what? <laughs> um, do, do, do you yeah, represent you Jason Gibbs? You mentioned that um, you know this is an inc incremental process, and I know we had talked previously about why that that's a deliberate deliberate choice and why that approach is valuable. Doing that sort of incremental uh, change in healthcare reform. Sure. Can I stop you guys? No. So, I, I mean, so let me explain why I think incremental is important. I would also say that you should ask providers why it is as well. So, changing the incentives and putting providers at risk, you should not do that all at once in giant dollar amounts. I mean, when you look at the healthcare um, spend in the state of Vermont, all in six billion dollars, but just the hospitals over two billion. If you said, hey, we're just going to change the way we pay and put you all at risk, boy, that could be a financial nightmare which would actually hurt people. Doing it in small ways as, so that folks can learn how the payments change, how the incentives change, and then change the care delivery model to make that work is really hard work. Dr. Fred Niffen said at a meeting I was at uh, four weeks ago, hey, Al, what you did with your team with the all-payer model, you know, that, you know, that was really important. but." We have the hard work to do. We have to go out and actually change the way we're delivering care and the way that we're coordinating, communicating across providers, um, and also get patients to behave differently so that they interact with the healthcare system differently. So, incremental is the only reasonable way to do this for a bunch of reasons, but um, the financial one is the one that would scare me the most if you went too big too fast. And now we're out of time. Just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> so, Governor, today the health department came out with a water quality report that showed it was a pilot of 16 schools' water quality for lead and showed that all 16 schools had levels that exceeded uh, what the health department felt were uh, acceptable and safe levels. And, and they said every school in the state should be tested. But I'm not sure they addressed how that was going to be paid for. Do you, do you accept that conclusion that every school should be tested and is that something the state will pay for? Uh, I accept that we have a responsibility to test every school for water quality uh, in terms of what, uh, what our children are, are uh, ingesting. Um, and we'll figure out how to pay for it. But, uh, but I agree uh, that we should be, we have to pay attention to that. The health risk is, uh, is dramatic. Can I add to that? Sure. So let me just add this, that, um, that when you look at the pilot program, you're correct, it identified 16. But the cost to remediate was between $250 and $500 per school. And so when you look at the benefit to the cost, I think this is just something that just has to happen. So um, it's money, but it's not, you know, I wouldn't want to leave people thinking it's an incredible amount of money per school. Well, is it the state's responsibility to, who, I mean, who's going to pay for this? I mean, you have to pay for the testing itself, right? Sure, which is about $1,000 to $1,200, right? I mean, I just want to give scale yeah. to this because it's not, you know, $500,000 per school or something because I think people, when, when we first started talking about it, I think people thought it was a huge number to, like, repipe and replumb entire schools. I just don't want anyone to leave with that on their mind. So it's, it's not a, an incredible amount of money per school, but it's an incredibly important thing. And as the governor said, We'll, we'll figure that out. Do you accept that it is a state responsibility to pay for it? 
well, it's a society uh, issue. Uh, and so uh, regardless of who pays, and we'll have discussions about who will pay for that uh, at, the, uh, at the end of the day, uh, we're going to get it done uh, in some way. And if the state has to do it, we'll do it. But, uh, but as well, uh, we'll look for other resources. Uh, now that the deal has been finalized, how do you feel about the move of the inmates to Mississippi, particularly given that the facility that they're going to be moved to has um, arguably questionable record when it comes to health care for inmates? Well, again, I think the good news is uh, under the, uh, the previous agreement with Pennsylvania, we didn't have a lot of control. Uh, once, we, once we sent uh, some of the prison population to uh, Pennsylvania, uh, it was under their, uh, under their system. Uh, dealing with uh, with a, an outside contractor, private uh, contractor, we're able to make uh, that con contractual relationship work for us and uh, and our uh, uh, offenders as well. So, I uh, I believe this will prove to be a, a, a better deal, a better situation uh, for the offenders and for the state. Some Democrats are calling a for-profit contract on its face and more. Well, this is, uh, you know, this is the fourth administration. Uh, this wasn't started by a Republican. Uh, this was started by uh, uh, Governor Dean. Uh, and uh, so Governor Dean and Con Hogan, as a matter of fact. Uh, and they sent, uh, there was a, a number, uh, a greater number uh, over the years than we have today. Uh, we want, I would like to see all the offenders uh, housed in Vermont. Uh, but that's going to take some change, uh, and we're going to. We started that conversation last year. We'll continue it to this year, uh, but uh, but it can't happen overnight. And I think you'll find uh, some Democrats who would agree uh, that this is the, the, our only uh, alternative at this point. Uh, we can't we can't do it overnight without jeopardizing the safety of Vermonters and and uh, and, and just turning everything on its head. So you don't think there's anything immoral? About I don't see anything wrong. immoral about it. Do you have any concerns about it at all? Well, there's always a concern in every situation, whether it was in uh, Michigan or Pennsylvania or Kansas uh, and now Mississippi. Of course, we have concerns. Uh, we'll continue to monitor this. Uh, we take we don't take this uh, lightly, uh, and uh, we don't take the move lightly. Uh, but but again, at the end of the day, we have to do uh, what's uh, fiscally responsible as well as. Uh, what's uh, what's uh, responsible for us uh, under uh, under the Department of Corrections? Vermont's prison population has been declining over recent years, and, and the out-of-state number has been declining as well. Um, I was wondering, Governor, if there's any particular initiative that you have in mind that you would support to further reduce the prison population, whether it's you know reform on the front end or reforms in terms of when people can be released. So. Uh, in uh, last year's budget, uh, most recently passed budget, there's seven million dollars for juvenile justice reform. Mm -hmm. It's not juvenile justice that would not be in corrections. It actually goes up in years into the correctional population. And so with that money, the thought is how can you um, reform the correctional system uh, you know, to, to improve all of these outcomes? So the question is what impact would that have? I think there'll be a lot of talk about reform of cash bail, but that's a criminal justice reform, not a correction. You know, the, the Secretary of HHS and the Commissioner of Corrections are not going to, you're not going to do that kind of do that kind of work. It's not our, it's, it's not our thing. That's truly criminal justice. I think also, though, I would caution everyone to take a look at the prison population and who's in it in terms of why they were uh, incarcerated. And look at who left over, since 2007. It tells an amazing story of misdemeanors um, no longer um, serving uh, extended time in corrections and being left with basically a felony uh, uh, population. And so how you lower that number from here gets difficult and is a case by case, individual by individual, hard topic. Um, and so yeah. to, to under, underscore yeah. that, I mean, those some of those uh, situations, the easier situations have been dealt with over the last uh, two or three years uh, or, or more to come to this uh, this lower number. And now those uh, those they're felons, uh, basically a lot of felons uh, that are that are currently being uh, uh, 
housed uh, in uh, some of the out of state populations. So it does get more difficult. And uh, we, I don't mind having the conversation, uh, but, uh, but public safety is uh, the highest priority from my standpoint. And, uh, and some, uh, some are um, incarcerated for good reason. Governor, do you believe that Vermont is incarcerating people right now that either shouldn't be incarcerated or don't need to be incarcerated? Well, I, again, that's a policy question that we should uh, we should debate. Uh, I, I would uh, repeat that I think some of those situations have already been dealt with over the last uh, two or three years, and uh, and some of those, most, uh, I, I would say, the majority of them now uh, are uh, convicted felons. So. I, I'm, I'm not sure that th those easier situations are there to, to deal with, but we'll take a look. And, and I would also add, if you, if you look at the facility report that we did last year, um, that we still stand behind. Some people have written that we pulled it back or that we, you know, panned, you know, we canned it or something. We, you know, we didn't. We pushed that for every single, I pushed that for every single day of the legislative session. You know, I, I'll push it again today if they come back today. Um, but if you look at it, it wasn't a giant facility it was a bunch of small facilities to address particular needs you know we need a new women's correctional facility if you don't think we do let's go meet at the Chittenden County Correctional Facility we need better mental health group home like facilities and corrections because we don't have that now we're trying to build it in some of the facilities it's not the right answer we need better ADA compliant facilities and corrections we don't have those and so there's a long way we need to go in terms of rehabilitative and therapeutic facilities for the Department of Corrections that were, that were in that report that need to be looked at again. As well as transitional housing. Sure. Uh, because that's, uh, uh, that is proven uh, to be uh, very difficult uh, to accomplish, uh, but is necessary uh, for those who are returning to normal life. So Al, they, there is no uh, recidivism uh, at that point. You're not discouraged with the reception that the prison campus plan received at the state house. It seemed to get a lot of people thought it was a terrible idea. Well, every, everyone thought the all pair model was a terrible idea five years ago. I mean, like this is the way it works. You know, you have to put out ideas, suffer the slings and arrows, stick to your knitting, and keep trying to move forward. I believe that th that folks are beginning to see this differently that they're beginning to say, hey, maybe we need to take a look at why we put people out of state. We've done it for 20 years. Maybe we need to look at this and say, is this what we want to be doing? You can't blame the commission, the commissioner of corrections for something we've done for 20 years as a choice by the people of Vermont. You have to look at it as a choice by everyone. And so if we don't like that choice, change it. So, and so it was a bad idea last year. But it might be a good idea but, this but, year. But again, I think you should uh, focus on as well why uh, they thought it was a bad idea. It may have not been the the campus type approach. Uh, there was a variety of reasons they thought sure. it was bad. Um, so uh, those can all be f f rectified. I mean, this is just a plan. Uh, and uh, when you get into the details, and and I would say that some who may have disagreed with that approach might might agree with us to, in saying we need to bring that out of state uh, population home. Uh, we want them to be housed in Vermont. Well, to do that, uh, we're going to have to find another approach because we have outdated uh, uh, prisons at this point that needed to, uh, need to be replaced, correctional facilities. So uh, we're willing to have that conversation. So is the administration going to pitch another uh, proposal to increase capacity in the criminal justice system in the next legislative session? We are going to continue uh, to talk about the, uh, the plan that we put forward and we're willing to have the conversations about how we can make it more enticing and better for uh, legislative uh, uh, buy-in. So you're going to work with the same plan? Well, I mean, there's a, it's, again, it's just a, a plan. It's just a, a goal. And if we can figure out what the goals we want to accomplish, uh, then we can we can work with within those constraints. So I'm I'm not uh, uh, I'm optimistic that we'll we'll come together on something. Governor, mm -hmm. you're you're um, uh, on October second. You're going to be appearing uh, in Anderson County with Paul Ralston and Maria Odette at an event. Um, are you endorsing them? Um, well, you find out on October second. Uh, uh, is is the Republican candidate Peter Briggs being invited? Uh, I am not aware of who's invited to that event. Okay, should he be? I mean, he's he's a fellow Republican. I uh, again, I, I'm not sure who's invited to the event at this point. 
Uh, your thoughts about the apparent resolution to the uh, long-running nurses dispute in Vienna? I think it's good news uh, that there is resolution. We can move forward at this point uh, for all of those involved, uh, for the, the nurses as well as the, uh, the administration of the hospital. So uh, we need to, it's, it's long overdue. Can we, can we afford the, the last best offer was upped last night to a better last, last best offer. Is that something we can afford? Well, I, you know, I, costs, increasing costs uh, are a, an issue for us. The affordability of Vermont is something that, uh, that I talk a lot about. Um, at this point, uh, we're going to have to, um, so we'll, we'll have to figure it out. But uh, uh, any time that the costs are increased, uh, it's a problem for us in attracting more people to the state. One more question. Uh, do you think the Republican Party, your party, is handling appropriately the accusations leveled by Professor Blasey Ford against a Supreme Court nominee uh, alleging sexual assault? I can only tell you how I feel. Um, and uh, uh, I believe uh, this is a lifetime appointment. Uh, I would advocate uh, that they should take the time necessary to make sure they get it right. Uh, and, uh, and I believe that uh, this should be uh, thoroughly, uh, thoroughly looked at uh, so that we don't make any mistakes. Does that mean you favor uh, the idea of having the FBI do an investigation? I, I'm just saying uh, that uh, it's in the Senate's hands at this point. Uh, but if they ask my advice, I would uh, take the time necessary, uh, whether that's in, in, in any way they think is uh, they deem um, um, possible uh, to make sure that they're doing this and making sure justice is served uh, and that everyone is treated fairly. So uh, I think we should we should take the t take our time, lifetime appointment. This Do is the accusations seem incredible? I have to believe that they are. Uh, I don't but but I, I'm not the I'm not the judge of that and I believe that they that's why they should take the time necessary uh, to to uh, to fully uh, contemplate that. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you all.